I got a thumbs up. Welcome, everyone. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit suspicious. This is a rigging talk, guys. So whoever might have gotten lost, uh, feel free to, to find the talk that you actually meant to go to. Um, my name is Demeter, uh, or Met, and I am the character rigger at uh, Blender Animation Studio. Um, so I rigged um, all the movies, uh, mm -hmm. Coffee Run onwards, so uh, Sprite Fright, Wing It, Charge, um, and the upcoming one. And for those who haven't seen <laughs> Wing It, uh, it looks something like this. We don't need audio. And in this talk, I'm going to be talking about the face rigs, um, specifically the mouths. So as you can see, um, we have some pretty wild deformations going on there. And we used geometry nodes and like a lot of different layers of geometry nodes tech um, to, to make this work. Um, and I'll also show you, let's just jump into a shot file real quick so you can see it kind of um, more up close and personal. So here's a shot file from the production. And it plays, and you see this um, 2D mesh thing, which is kind of going to be the biggest topic of the talk. Um, you can see how it deforms, and in turn, it deforms the 3D mesh as well. Um, and it is controlled by an armature, like normal. Uh, so if I grab this guy and move it around, it moves things around like so. Like that. Of course, it still takes a lot of time and effort and talent to create nice, beautiful poses, which our animators have done. Um, but I hope this gives you kind of an initial idea of what's going on. So you can see kind of it's deforming the mesh along the original silhouette of the character. And that's what we want to achieve today. Um, I don't promise that this will be possible to follow along on. But if you want to try, like definitely not live. I'm sorry, guys, like there's no way. But if you want to follow along at home, um, then what you can do, and I don't have the URL saved, so I'm just going to browse it. But you know what? Maybe it's more, better that way. So if you go to studio.blender.org, um, we have all the assets of our film. Well, maybe not all the assets, but all kinds of um, stuff that you can get uh, about our films. Uh, some of it is free. Some of it is behind a paywall. The thing I'm about to show you is free, which is the, the files that I'll be using today. Uh, if you go to Wing It, uh, see movie, explore content gallery, and then I think I put it in uh, rigging, so research and development, rigging, and then if you go all the way to the bottom. So this is all the, the tech the, uh, live as I was coming up with it here in the beginning. You know, it's uh, for, with previous productions assets when we didn't have assets yet. Uh, and then here at the bottom, we have Blender Conference 2023 files, and you can download it from here. Um, different checkpoints, and uh, yeah. So that's where you can find it. And so let me get started with this file right here. This here is my friend Jerry. And he, is, he happens to be a sphere, but this tech will work on any um, character shape. On sharper edges, it might act weird, but you probably wouldn't have sharp edges uh, in a character like where you would use this tech anyways. Um, as you can see, this. Thing. This ball is uh, pretty simple. All I did was like summon a cube, subdivide it three times, rotate it a bit, um, and, and that's pretty much it. Um, and maybe I will give you a sneak peek of the final result real quick, uh, which is going to look uh, something like this. Uh, OK, but now let's go back to the beginning. OK, so first thing that we have to do is create a UV map, which is going to be obviously that kind of 2D shape that you guys have been seeing. Um, and so to do that, it's kind of like creating a regular UV map, uh, except with some you know, principles. So I'll just open my UV editor, and I'll hide my asset browser. Um, and hello, why do I not see any UV? Oh, because I don't have any UVs yet. OK, this is fine. Uh, so you want to have the area that you will be deforming on a single UV island. And also, in case anybody is confused why UVs are involved in rigging, a UV map is just a generic you know, 2D coordinate system. It, it's not only useful for shading. It can be useful for any kind of uh, data or whatever. In this case, we're going to use it for rigging. So I have made this cut uh, through my subdivided cube, which I will be using as a UV seam. 
um, and that means I'm kind of aiming to deform uh, this half of the sphere, um, which will kind of start making sense in a sec. So I have my UV seam. I'll unwrap that. And then I want to, so this back side, which is not going to deform, I kind of don't care about. But just to be nice and clean, I'll try to make it like uh, reasonably positioned and whatnot. Uh, but there's going to be a bit of eyeballing involved here in a second. Uh, so I want, it's kind of important for these, uh, also they don't have to fit into the one by one grid, it doesn't matter at all. Um, what does matter, uh, and you'll only see why quite a long time from now, is that, um, oops, that's not what I meant to do. What I mean to do is uh, to move the 2D cursor to 0 0.5 on X. And it's important for the UV map to be symmetrical along that point. Uh, and so I'm just going to kind of uh, rotate this thing and just kind of eyeball it initially. And then I'll do a more proper uh, step in a second. So I'm going to select the middle loop here. I'm going to set my pivot to the 2D cursor and I'm going to say SX0. And so now at least that center line is perfect. Um, I'll do the same for this one, even though it really doesn't matter. SX0, there we go. And then because I want that to be perfectly symmetrical, and right now it isn't, I, there's probably nicer ways to do this, but I think the easiest, easiest way, and for the sake of this talk, to keep it simple, I'm just going to delete this half and do a mirror modifier, um, which has an option to mirror UVs, and I think I want the V axis probably, and if not, we'll undo, and then we apply. Uh, I guess not. <laughs> then we try the U axis, apply. There we go. So now we have a uh, perfectly symmetrical UV map along the center. And the reason this will be important later is for symmetrical posing. So once we have this 2D mesh in the 3D world and we have bones hooked up to it, our bones are going to have names like .l and .r that uh, signify whether it's on the left or right side. And you know, Blender has uh, tools for symmetrical posing and that kind of stuff. And that's where it's going to come into play, which is far future. Uh, but so now you know. Uh, okay, so next step is indeed to create that 2D mesh. And this is where GeoNodes is going to first come into play. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it yet, but I am not intending to go into actual node setups very much. Maybe I will quickly pan through them. But for the most part, I'm just going to be using uh, pre-existing GeoNodes. And the reason for that is just like um, if there's to get this setup working, it's going to be quite a few GeoNode setups. So if I went into them, it would be a seven hour long talk, unfortunately. But still, I think the title is valid. We are going to be using Geonodes, as you'll see. So I'm just going to duplicate my mesh. And this will become our 2D thing. So I add a Geonode modifier, and maybe it's already in my file. Uh, yes, so I have a transform to UV map uh, node setup. So this should be kind of a simple one if I open the correct node tree. Uh, so this actually I stole from Simon, who you guys might have seen yesterday. Uh, it looks like that. Um, and what that will allow us to do is if we specify a UV map, which we will specify the one we just created, then we get this mesh. And you can see with the factor that that got created like this. Oh, and that actually reminds me we, OK, there is one thing I forgot to make sure, but it, it might be fine. So if I go back to my UV map, uh, I want to make sure that up is up and left is left. OK, I got lucky. Uh, so this is fine. Yeah, it looks good. For this one, it doesn't matter. OK, so this should be good. So I'm just going to let this do its thing. And then I'm going to apply this. And now we have this 2D mesh. And of course, our goal is to sort of transfer deformations from this guy um, to the 3D mesh. I'm doing some tra tra transformations here kind of for convenience. I am never going to apply those transformations um, because that would ruin the the um, sort of, um, what's the word, the correlation between the object's coordinate system, um, which the next GeoNode setup is going to expect, uh, which we can already do. So this is going to be kind of the, the main heart and soul of everything, which is the UV deform GeoNode setup, which is kind of what it implies. It's going to deform our 3D mesh based on its own UV map, as well as a representation of its UV map that exists as an object, which of course is the UV object. So I'm just going to uh, pick her that thing. I'll also give this a proper name. Uh, Jerry had, let's say, 2D mesh. 
Um, there we go. And then I'll select my UV map. And it is broken. Oh, right. Uh, so also um, from Simon's talk yesterday, some people have learned of the address position attribute, which is, um, and there was a question of like, why is it useful? It's not only useful for shading stuff and like sticking coordinate systems to things, uh, but also for rigging. Uh, and I need it on both objects here. And there we go. Now it no longer explodes because this GeoNode setup somewhere in there, I probably can't find it, but somewhere it relies on the um, attribute that is called exactly rest underscore position, which is kind of a hard-coded attribute in Blender that gets created by this checkbox. And what that contains is just um, the, the vertex positions of this mesh before any modifiers, before any shape keys, before any deformation, uh, which is handy when we're trying to figure out uh, sort of deltas of movements, which is what it's going to be relying on. Uh, that probably didn't make sense, but uh, maybe in just a second it will. So because this setup is kind of already done, and I like to, what I like to do for naming my GeoNode modifiers is just mouse hover this, control C, mouse hover this, control V. Uh, kind of wish Blender just did that, to be honest. But anyways, uh, so now, because this GeoNode setup is now kind of already set up, and by the way, I mean, it looks like this. It's like it's splitting up the mesh again, then it's, you know, taking deltas from the difference between the 2D mesh and the UV map, and then calculating depth, offset, and blah, 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 all that garbage. <clears throat> so I'm sorry, uh, the files, like I showed in the beginning, are available online. You're free to delve into this yourself, uh, but I don't have time to, nor the brain cells. I mean, I made this, but I don't remember what half of this does anymore. Um, so, but anyways, the so point is, this already works, and we can prove that by, well, first I'll do it wrong. So now if you just try to sculpt on this, it's not going to work. And that's because you are deforming its rest position. So to do something that is not that, you can add the shape key. And now the rest position stays untouched. And you are instead transforming you know, the final result um, of this mesh. And the, ge the geonodes can then tell the difference between that and its original and use that to deform the sphere along its UVs. So great. Job's done, uh, except there's so many, so many things that can go wrong and that you still need for this to be a usable character. Um, I'm not even sure, I haven't looked at my notes yet. I, I, here we have a few steps where the order doesn't matter that much, uh, but uh, let me try to stick to my order. So yeah, masking, okay. So obviously you want your character to have a mouth and that would mean like getting rid of these vertices in my case. Or in your case, you might have a character that is modeled with a mouth, and then bad news, um, you need to fill it in. Because um, when the Geonodes is going to be looking, okay, so let's say that in the future, you want to deform this vertex to this position, like this. Um, it's going to look like, hey, where is the original vertex coordinate of wherever I am now? And if there's no geometry here, then it's just going to say, well, there is no vertex coordinate, uh, UV coordinate, so I will just return 0, 0, uh, and that's not going to be good. So as far as this modifier is concerned, you need a, a complete mesh um, so that any area that you want to slide over needs to at some point exist. Uh, but after this modifier is done its processing, you are very welcome to mask it out. Um, which you can do with the mask modifier, except not in this case, because the mask modifier um, will hide vertices, which is going to look like this, which is hiding more than what I want. I want to just hide the faces, which would look like this, and we can only do that with geometry nodes, which is nice, because that's what this talk is about. And in this case, I don't think I have it prepped, but this is a node setup that costs exactly one node, so I think I'll just do it. And I just call this mask by attribute, and I like to prefix it with gn dash, and control c, control v. And so to create a simple masking node setup, you would just do a switch, and then you say if the switch is true, then you show the mesh, and the switch is of course your uh, mask. And that's probably it. And then, hey, why is this not a, why is it not an attribute? Hi, yeah. Mm, now it is. 
Okay, I'm confused. Instead of a boolean, do I want something else? Like uh, mix, boom, ah. I'll just use that then, whatever. Oh yeah, I guess. Okay, I mean, this will work. I thought the other one should also work. No, okay. Wait, sorry? The delete geometry node. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess that's what I used. No, but I thought I used the switch. Oh, no, that's a different thing. Okay, my bad. Thank you, Hans. Okay, then let's just go back to what we're doing. There we go. It's useful to have Geonos devs in the audience. Uh, <laughs> um, mask? The mask. Okay. And then we use an attribute, and we haven't created it yet, but I have my selection here already because I was making that selection while explaining stuff. So if we go to attributes, we add a new attribute, we call it um, mouth mask, let's say. The domain is faces, and the data type is, I just want a Boolean. And then what we should be able to do is set attribute, which I'm sure this operator exists somewhere in the interface, but whatever. Uh, so now, it's not really represented in the 3D view, but now we've assigned a value of true for these faces on this attribute. And so now we specify that attribute uh, to this modifier here. And instead of deleting points, we want to delete faces. And there we go, we have a mouth. I also made Jerry teeth, but I'm not actually going to use them, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, so there we go, we have a mouth. And then if you want to be fancy, you can add your solidify and your subsurf and your edge crease. If I can make a proper selection here, just to make Jerry look a little bit nicer. So if you do shift E one, there we go. There you go. So Jerry has a mouth. And so now this still works, not because we don't have a shift key, question mark? No, because the shift key is a zero. So there you go, this still works. So we're making progress. Now it really looks like a mouth. And hell, if you wanna make a still frame of a character, then maybe this is already enough. But you want to animate this, and just sculpt node is not enough to animate this, unless you're gonna animate it frame by frame, which honestly, I mean, if you're making a few seconds thing, go for it. Uh, okay, so. Thankfully, this is non-destructive, so we can just get rid of it and reset to where we were. Um, okay, and then the next step. What is the next step? Oh my god, we're, we're really far gone already, actually. Um, okay, the next step. Okay, this is gonna be fun. So when it comes to this 2D mesh, you could deform it in a million ways. And also there's something that I, that is a useless point that I forgot to make, which is that when it comes to rigging Jerry, if you don't want to do it this way, the way that you would normally do it, you could just give him give him a regular old you know shape key based rig where you sculpt a bunch of shape keys, you hook it up to a bunch of drivers, and I mean it's gonna work, but creating those shape keys is gonna be a pain if you want to preserve the silhouette perfectly. If you don't care about that, if that is not part of your style, then go for it, whatever. Um, but if you're going for a style where you want a sphere to stay a sphere or you know your curvy character to preserve those curves while they are emoting, uh, that's when this tech is going to be useful. So it's quite specific, but again, this is mostly about um, wing it, and that's what we wanted there. Although we do want to break the silhouette in some ways, which we did with like armature modifiers and lattices uh, in special cases. Uh, so yes, that's one problem with if you try to just use shape keys for this kind of um, setup. And another is even if you sculpt it to a perfectly spherical shape, for example, by using a shrink wrap modifier in your process, um, the interpolation between the two poses is still gonna be linear, which means like when your character is halfway through an expression, even if your final shape is perfect, which mine isn't obviously because I was just doing this quickly, even if your final shape is perfect, your transition might still be a bit janky. Uh, which you can, again, try to address with shrink wrap, and that is, in fact, what we did on Sprite Fright, and clearly it worked, because we made Sprite Fright, but the fact is it was difficult and pretty annoying, and this is basically just an evolution of that tech in my eyes. Uh, so there you go, just wanted to get that out of the way. So, when it comes to deforming not the 3D mesh directly, but the 2D mesh, you could also do it in a bunch of different ways. Uh, you could set up a shape key based rig on this, and honestly, that would probably be totally fine. 
You could also rig this with bones, and honestly, that would probably be totally fine. But that would all be too simple, and this talk would be too short. So instead, we're going to do something kind of complicated and, and new, and I think in, in exciting, which is to rig it using a curve. And so I'm just going to go ahead and add a Bezier circle. I'll just rotate that 90 degrees. Maybe I should do this in edit mode. I don't think it matters. No, it doesn't matter. Um, but I will scale it in edit mode. And what I want to do is, of course, just match this roughly to my mouth, uh, which if I want to um, signify that better, I can kind of repeat the steps that I just did earlier for the, <laughs> yeah, when you enter edit mode, things get a bit wacky. So let me repeat some of the steps that I did for the 3D mesh, which, by the way, if I did this in a better order, then I wouldn't have to repeat. But it's fine. I think we have plenty of time. Well, actually, I have no idea how much time I have. Oh, so much time. Um, and so what I want to repeat is the attribute stuff. And we're going to have a mouth, mask, domain, face, type, boolean, OK, select, set attribute, mouth, mask, yes. Modify, whoops, modify geometry nodes, mask by attribute, attribute, math mask. There you go. This is just so we can see better. That area of the mesh on the 2D mesh doesn't actually matter. It has no effect on this whole setup. It's just uh, nicer as a visual um, thing. In fact, we can also use this while we're at it to hide this area, which is not going to deform because it's the, the back of the character and it doesn't matter. So let me just do that. Uh, just do set attribute again. And then if I. Interesting. Okay, we're, uh, Hans is watching, it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so now that we can see kind of better what we're doing, I want to uh, snap these curve points kind of perfectly to uh, my vertices. It technically kind of doesn't matter if it's perfect, but like you want to do a nice job and it's probably better if it is uh, perfectly placed. Uh, so there we go. I'm just using, it's a shame I have to do so much object, object mode snap, uh, switching for this one, but there you go. And then this is the Pi menu that I think is built in now for cursor snapping. That's why it's uh, quite fast to do. Um, and this is not enough curve points. You can have as many as you want. I have decided that I want uh, just uh, four more for those points. And I can do that easily by just pressing W and say subdivide. And then I get more points, and then I'll do the same snapping shenanigan for those guys, which will just take a minute of rapid and violent clicking. And then there will be a kind of weird aspect to this as well, which is the fact that, okay, so obviously this curve, you can see it better if I go into ice, uh, you can see, okay, in object mode you can see it. It's all wobbly. We want to rotate things a bit so it's nice and smooth, um, but you can't symmetrically edit curves in Blender as far as I know. So what I tend to do is just, I have to say, I, I'm strictly in front view, and I say R15, eh, too much, R10, eh, good enough. And then I go on the opposite side, I remember the number, R minus 10, R10, uh, cannot make segment, wrong button, R10, R minus 10, oops, R, Minus 10, there we go. Uh, okay, so it's better, it's better. But yeah, so you get the idea, it's kind of silly, but um, it works. And then I wanna set the handle types from automatic to aligned, which may or may not matter, but I think it matters. Because I mean, we're gonna hook the, yeah, it will matter because in the future we are going to hook up these curve points to bones. And if the curve points were set to automatic, then the bones, um, the hook modifiers for the handles, I think, would not work. I'm pretty sure. Okay, so they need to be aligned. And then I'll also uh, shrink these down along individual origins. So yeah, when doing stuff like this, my main point in this section being that while symmetrical editing of curves is not possible, if you know what you're doing and you're careful, then you can get it done. Um, for example, you know, if you wanna move these curve points outwards, then you would just select both of them, set your um, pivot to bounding box center and just scale them like this. And that way you can be sure that it's, everything stays symmetrical. Okay, we have a curve. I'm gonna give it a name. Um, I'll call it Cur Mouth. 
Uh, and now the next uh, node setup comes into play. So I'm going to select this guy. And, and by the way, this is all going to look very simple, but then you'll see the problems. So we can just have another Geo node setup. And then, OK, this is where I need to go to my asset library because I don't have the nodes that I want. Uh, and the node setup that I want is, um, I wish I could see the full name. Hello. Curve deform single iterative. You see, that's not the one. Curve proximity deform iterative. How do I do this? Can I drag and drop it here? No. Ah, oh, shit. Here. Ooh, OK. That works. Oh, and in this case, it sets the name. Interesting. <laughs> OK. Um, so this node setup is actually, can, we, can I show it to you in a different environment where I think it's a little bit better? So it's this guy here. Uh, no, it's not, is it? No, it's this guy here. So what that node setup lets us do is have a curve and kind of deform the mesh in a really cool way, which was kind of, um, uh, Simon also gave me a tip for this. So the, the node, node tree, as you saw, was called curve deform iterative. Uh, Geonodes don't have for loops, but it turns out you don't need for loops, you can just copy paste stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> there's the single iter, this one iteration of this logic, this deformation logic. And then that looks like this, which is not too bad, I guess. Uh, and then you just repeat that uh, 10 times, but then you have a limiter here, so how many times you want to use it. Obviously, this is pretty expensive, so the more iterations you use, the more expensive it will be. But now, as for the purpose of what is the point of it being iterative as opposed to just one iteration is because what that lets you do is notice how these outside vertices do not deform when I'm jiggling this, but as I move closer to them, they do get deformed eventually. Um, and that is because of the iterative aspect of it that like, as I'm moving this, it runs uh, in this case four times and you can kind of think of it as like it's running. Uh, so let's say that I have a, a movement from this point to this point, and I, I drew it in the opposite direction, but whatever. Uh, it's going to start picking up new vertices to influence uh, four times throughout this journey. And that's what allows you to kind of um, get this really cool effect of where, like, it, you know, um, yeah. I don't know, it's all squishy and squashy and nice. And this kind of reduces the amount of masks that you need to paint, um, and you can get, like, really nice deformation before the mesh starts breaking. So I can illustrate that by reducing the iterations to one. You can see that um, here, the because it's not picking up more vertices to, to influence, it just starts um, clamping these vertices and then start, stuff starts getting inverted and all that. Whereas if you allow it to pick up more vertices to deform, then it's nice like that. Okay, so that's the node setup that we are going to be using. Do you think I saved the file before I came here? Yes, nice. Uh, <laughs> we have all to save, it's fine. Um, so, now here's the thing. You guys remember this very important checkbox that meshes have called address position. Uh, curves don't have that. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, on one hand, I could say Hans is watching, but in theory, hopefully in the future, because now hairs have this new curve data type, I don't know, I don't know where it is. Uh, for, uh, hopefully we will be able to control those like the old style Bezier curves, but until then, because these old style things don't support the uh, address position um, feature, we will just have to duplicate this. Hello, yeah, and we are going to have one that is called underscore rest, which is going to basically store the rest position for us. Which means we are never gonna, we don't want to touch this object anymore. It is important that this doesn't change, so I can hide it like that. And then I can rename this to underscore def, which stands for deforming. So this is going to be the object that stores our deformed curve. And so now we can go back to this node setup. You can see it demands a rest curve and a deformed curve. Uh, so I just specify those like so. And now, in theory, if you move the deformed curve, Ah, there you go. You can kind of deform the thing and in turn deform Jerry with a curve. 
So there you go, progress. But obviously, this is pretty rough still. Uh, so first things first. I think I will uh, create a deformation on this, but to make that non-destructive, I will just do it in a shape key. And the reason for that is because I want to nail down one of the parameters here, which is the max distance, which is just an absolute space distance um, that one iteration of the vertex deformation uh, logic picks up. So I just reduce that until I, I'm kind of happy. Um, we are on three iterations, which I think is reasonable. And so I just play with this value until it's fine. There you go. Another thing we want to set is that we don't want to affect the, the outer rim, um, since that's pretty much the edge of where we want to deform things. And I mean, if, if Jerry's topology was different, um, then he could allow for even more deformation. But in this case, you know, we're keeping it simple. And yeah, we always want to not deform the, the outer edge of the, of the UV island that we're working with, since then the, the node setup is just going to, you know, like you can see here, it's kind of, it's actually not as bad as I expected. But anyways, it's not ideal. Oh, that's just from the subdivision. Uh, right. Okay, there you go. So without subsurf, you can see it is breaking. Subsurf cleans it up a bit by coincidence. But so we want to avoid that. And to do that, we can just simply paint an influence mask, like on many Geonodes uh, setups that you might be familiar with. Um, so to do that, I'll probably just actually use weight painting. Uh, maybe disable these things for a second. Yeah, so uh, I want to use vertex masking in weight painting, and that doesn't work when some, in some cases it doesn't work. Uh, I think it's probably when you're modifying the geometry, in this case, like by deleting geometry. Okay, so anyways, I want to paint. So I have entered weight paint mode, and I want to just add weights to the inner area. So notice how the outer uh, vertices don't have a white dot. Oh, and I would like to have accumulate, please. They don't have a white dot, so I cannot paint on them. So I'll just paint this fully red. And then, and this is, I wish this was symmetrical. Maybe I can make this symmetrical. Let's try. Uh, this one I don't actually need for this one. And then I'm just going to hold shift and smooth, and it's symmetrical. Okay, nice. Oh, but I want that to accumulate as well, please. So I need to go to this and this and this and back here and shift. Okay. So now we're going to have our influence kind of fade out towards the edge of this UV island. And this is going to, you know, it's going to limit how far we can push Jerry's facial expressions. So you do want to actually kind of spend time to make this mask, to experiment with this mask later on and try to push it as far as you can. Uh, but for now, let's just see what we got. Uh, what was that group called, by the way, that I just painted? It's just called group. I'm going to call it um, influence mask, I guess, so like UV deform influence mask. And then I paste that here. And there you go. So now you can see the silhouette is no longer changing, and the geometry is not really overlapping. It's not breaking. It's, it's pretty fine. So that's good. Next problem, however, let's say I put this back roughly here. Now notice if I try to move the top um, of this thing, it actually ends up affecting the bottom as well. And, and in the 3D character, that also is not ideal. And the reason that's happening, short story, because it, we have a single spline, and Blender doesn't necessarily know, you know, that's like this bottom half of the spline should not move. Like, even though the curve points are not moving, that in a way, the spline is moving. It, maybe that doesn't make any sense, but whatever. Let's just fix it. And how do we fix it? <laughs> well, it's complicated. Uh, <clears throat> so first things, so what we, want to, what we want to do, basically, is just split this into more than one spline. In Wingit, we had four splines. We had a top, bottom, left, and right. For Jerry, we'll go a little bit simpler. We just have a top and a bottom. So I'm going to select all the, the top um, curve points. And I'm going to press, I think, Y. Yes, Y. And that uh, splits the curve. So now we have one spline up here, which I can hide. Uh, this thing is the, OK, I don't know what the thing is, whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then you have the bottom half. And now the issue is, of course, we had our rest curve 
which is now has nothing to do with the, with the deform curve. So we have to basically just delete that one, duplicate the deform curve, rename it back to rest, go to this geonode setup again, and fix that reference. And there we go. So now we have uh, two splines in our curve. So when we move the top section, it no longer affects the bottom section, which is great. And the node setup itself uh, doesn't care if there's multiple splines, this will work, which is good. <coughs> Except now we have two control points for the corner, which is weird and not ideal and not what you want, especially in the near future, because I'm going to be hooking up these curves to an armature um, procedurally using CloudRig. And CloudRig will not like automatically create a combined control for these overlapping curve points or anything like that. Uh, so one thing that I could do, which I'm not going to do, is just let CloudRig generate whatever it wants. It's going to have an overlapping set of controls for this curve point, and then I could like make a, a parent control for those that like unifies them. Uh, but that's a bunch of extra bones, extra complexity. I choose to add complexity in a way that doesn't add complexity to the armature itself, but instead other stuff that the animators don't have to touch. Um, so what I'm going to do, first off, I'm going to rename this just to suggest what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a multi-spline version of this curve. And this also gets called multi-spline. And then I duplicate it again. I wish I had saved the backup earlier because we're not sh now just going to recreate the previous version of it. Um, and then I'm going to call this one single spline. Um, and now I'm going to make this go back to being a single spline curve. And the way I do that is I just grab one, move it away, select the other one, press F, and then delete this guy. Same procedure on the opposite side. F, delete. Now we have a single spline curve again. And this is what we want to use to control the multi-spline curve. And again, reminder, the reason it's important that this is multi-spline is so that we can move the top half without affecting the bottom half. OK. <clears throat> um, I think before I actually make one follow the other, what I'm going to do first is um, uh, bust out CloudRig and uh, generate that uh, curve armature. And to do that, I'm actually going to duplicate Jerry's armature. Uh, for those who don't know what CloudRig is, it used to be a Rigify extension up until tomorrow. Uh, but in as of 4.0, so the future, it's going to be a standalone add-on. CloudRig is a tool for uh, generating armatures. And the reason it's going to become a standalone add-on is because it's also going to include other tools. So it's going to become a bit more um, feature creep, I guess. And it always was, anyways. Um, but anyways, so you can Google for Blender CloudRig, and you'll find, uh, find its repository, and you can download it. And so currently, it's a Rigify extension. You just slap it into Rigify. You enable Rigify. You learn how to use Rigify, uh, which you can do from last year's talk of mine. So to use such rig generation systems, we need two armatures. One is our meta rig, which contains information, and the other is the generated rig, which contains the result, I guess. So I'm just going to rename this guy to meta-jerry. And I'd like to not have it in the characters collection, but in the scene collection. Uh, and then what I want to do, currently Jerry's rig is a root bone, and he is like object parented to the armature, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm going to keep this root bone. I'm going to give it the cloud copy um, rigify type, or in the future, cloud rig component type. And I'm going to do some stuff here, like disable unified uh, selected FD colors. It's just a preference. And I'm going to disable create root, because I have a manually created root one here, uh, which is not really important, but whatever. And then the next thing I'm going to do is just add a new bone. Maybe I'll just snap a cursor there, do shift A, so it creates a single bone. I'm going to parent this to the, to, uh, whoa, interesting. Why is VSC picking up that input? Weird. Anyways, there we go. Oh, I think it's because I tapped on it with my finger. Okay, so now this bone is parented to the root. And I'm going to rename it to mouth, I guess. And then I'm going to assign cloud underscore curve as the rigify type. 
And this is one of my favorite um, cloud rig types, where you can just specify a curve object, which I'm going to give it. You know what? First, I'm going to show you what would happen if you did it wrong again. So I'm going to specify the multi-spline one, just to see what would happen if you just try to rig um, the curve while it is made of multiple splines. And another thing I want to do is specify the target rig is rig Jerry. And then I think we already have a widgets collection, so I'll specify that also. And that should be enough. And then, in theory, we should be able to click this button. And this rig object is going to have a bunch of bones, maybe on some hidden layer, whatever. And it's going to be great. Looks good. OK, oh, ah, I knew I would forget something. Uh, so the bones are massive. I'm going to fix that. So I can jump between my generated rig and my meta rig using Shift T. That works. And to make the bones not massive, um, this is a bit unintuitive, and you only know it if you know it, and I'm sorry about that. But what determines the display size of bones is not this, not the length of the bone. It's the bendy bone scale, which is, yeah, I know. So we make it smaller with Control-Alt-S, which is a shortcut that I think already got removed. Uh, <laughs> but I put it back. If, if it doesn't work for you, there's a tool here somewhere. I don't know. Um, it's still kind of big. And here's a cool thing about CloudRig. OK, now it's smaller. Uh, not just this idea of going back and forth and iterating on a million controls, but also I have a couple of checkboxes here, which I forgot to check. One is x-axis symmetry, and the other is controls for handles. So I'm just going to check those and regenerate again, which I'm, by the way, doing with, OK, I forgot something, uh, with control Alt r That's my regenerate uh, hotkey, which I think now comes uh, pre done in CloudRig. So in my earlier generations, I've created, well, CloudRig created all these hook modifiers. But when I change my settings, these hook modifiers are no longer valid. So we want to re remove all of these hook modifiers. And how are we going to do that? Basically, what you do is, and this is why a wireless mouse is very important. You pick up your mouse, you use two hands here, and you go. Either that, or you use a line of Python. But I think that <laughs> this way is way more fun. <clears throat> or you know, you would think you could just have a button here that says "Remove all modifiers," but nah, the technology is not there. Okay, so now we've nuked all our hook modifiers, so these don't do anything now. But if we regenerate, then only the good hook modifiers get recreated. Um, so on this guy, which we will need to remove again, by the way, because like I said, this is the wrong object. But so, anyways, hook modifiers are there. So now. This works, which is nice. And it just has this one problem that I mentioned before, that these controls are doubled. So we have one there for, I don't know, the top, and one for the bottom. No, the other way around. Uh, anyways, two is more than what we want there, which is the reason for why we created this single spline curve. So we go back to CloudRig, to this bone, and we change the target curve to the single spline one. We can regenerate. Uh, <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Ignore, ignore, ignore. Go away. OK. Uh, start, we regenerate. And then, yeah, again, we do the thing. Ah, got him. OK. See? But isn't it much faster when you pick up the mouse and you do this? Yeah. Way better. More ergonomic. OK. So now our hook modifiers are on this object instead. And that means we only have one control for the corner. But it's not doing anything, because even though the curve is moving, if you squint your eyes, you can see a black line there. It's moving. But the, mesh, the curve that is deforming our object is the multi-spline one. And we are moving the single-spline one. So we need a connection between those two. And here is going to be a bit of manual labor, which I intended to skip over. But I'm, oh, wait, I'm not that good on time. I only have six minutes. Then I might actually skip in the future. But I will show you one uh, iteration of this. So First things first, I'm going to just do some arbitrary deformation of this so that I can see what I'm doing. Then I go to the multi-spline one. And then I, my next GeoNode setup is to, yeah, I don't have it either. So I need to hop into my asset browser. And I want to have, first of all, I want to isolate this object, uh, glue curve points. There we go. And so this is kind of a one at a time type of deal. Uh, this GeoNode setup. Um, 
it needs a parent curve, which I want the single spline one, and then it wants uh, a parent and a child curve index, and it's just gonna, yeah, just glue those curve points, and you have to repeat this node setup a bunch of times. It's, it's a bit sad, so but you can just basically play with these index values until you find the correct uh, point. Oh, and to actually see what you're doing though, um, there you go. So that seems like the correct. That seems like the correct one. Yes, there we go. And then you would go ahead and duplicate this. And then you would increase the child's index and then the parent index. And this is very boring. And uh, yeah, in this case, it didn't work. So you want to go back around until you find the correct pairing. And you repeat that a bunch of times until. Oh, shit. Too far? Uh, no, no. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, so that's the thing. Once you've done that, uh, it all kind of works. So here you have, I think I might have called the objects a bit differently, sorry. Uh, yeah, so here I call this master, so this is supposed to be called single spline. Um, so now the, the multi-spline guy has a bunch of these geonode modifiers that are all the same, just with different index numbers, and that glues them to the single spline one. And that now means that you don't have a double control in the corner. You can move the top section without affecting the bottom section. And it took a lot of steps, but there you go. Now this kind of actually works and you can use it to make expressions. Wah! That's not what I meant, <laughs> but you can indeed also make him angry. Uh, and also oh, something I forgot to uh, return to is that symmetrical posing also works. Uh, I have it bound to shift X. So as you can see, we can pose this symmetrically, which is super nice. And uh, there you go. You can make some pretty cool expressions just like that. And there is one last problem, potential problem that you might run into, which is that when you try to go for really small, small shapes like this, what you'll notice is that it's not nice. But what's weird is that when you look at your curve that is responsible for this, for driving this deformation, the curve looks pretty great. It's fine. Um, so it's, uh, the problem is that, like I was doing in the beginning, the, the sort of perfect snapping of the curve points. Um, well, those points are fine, but then there are points like this one that is not perfectly on a curve point. So at small scales, that becomes uh, noticeable uh, in precision. So to fix that, we have one last geonode setup, which is probably not in the file again. Uh, no, it's not. So asset browser, nodes, nodes, pconf, nodes. The last node setup is attach verts to nearest point on curve. And this again just requires your um, uh, two curves, the rest and a deform. And it requires a mask of just the loop that you want to affect, which in my case is going to be not this guy. But this guy, which is already happens to be selected, so I'm just going to create a vertex group called lip loop, hit assign, and then specify that here on the mask, lip loop. And there you go. Now you can have nice and precise small mouse shapes and everything else. And you can create, ah, I, I tap my second screen with my finger again. And in the end, you can make all kinds of funky shapes. And there you go. And I believe that's pretty much my time, so thank you very much.